was a story that's coming out and it's a movie, short movie on Evan Tanner. And this isn't the first. There, there's been documentaries on Evan. Somebody was writing a book on Evan. There's been countless interviews on Evan. And it always makes me feel good to keep the memory of Evan was my friend. Evan was my teammate. To keep the memory around is something that is very cool. It's very hard for me to talk about Evan. I have to remind you he was my friend and teammate, because if you judge my tone or body language, you'll wonder how I'm so uncompassionate to somebody who suffered a fate like Evan did. But I can't talk about the topic without still getting mad. I'm mad about the whole thing that happened. There was even a point in my life where I was blaming. I mean, right, that's probably a normal thing. Somebody dies unexpectedly, you start, you start giving blame. And I was blaming the kids on the computer. Now, that I'm older and have matured, I don't know how bullish I would be on that, but there's still an element to that. Okay, back up, guys. Do you remember Evan Tanner? Let me start at the beginning. Evan Tanner came from Texas, and he came out to Team Quest. We had a little trailer in the back of the car lot. Inside of the car lot, what used to be the old detail shop, we threw down a bench press, a squat rack, and a mat. That is now Team Quest. And there was Dan, Randy, Matt, myself, and Robert Fallis was coaching us. And then before you know it, Chris Liebman walks to the door, and so a guy named Ed Herman walks to the door, and a Matt Horwich, I mean, the, the team really grew, but that's what, we didn't need a lot of space. I think that's the point I'm trying to make. The reason we could pull off a world-class gym with four athletes in a car lot, we, didn't, we only had four guys. We only had three guys. Pretty easy. We had all the room that we needed in that little space. So. Evan ends up joining the, the gym, and we knew who Evan was. Evan was a really interesting character because he had fought for a world championship already at that point. When he came out to the gym, he had already fought for a world title, and he never had a gym. He never had a coach. Evan had a buddy, and the buddy, I don't know if the buddy ever actually got in the ring and competed or not. He wanted to go down the same path as Evan. I, just, I don't know if he did, but they would get DVDs. They would get magazines. They would open the magazine and then work with each other and try to figure out the techniques. They would get the DVDs and try to work with each other. This is how we learned. He went all the way to a world championship. So a world championship fight. So now when he comes out, he's got an actual gym. He's got an actual facility. He's got equipment. He's got a coach in Robert. He's got teammates that are going to show up consistently and push up. Just one of these things that was pretty interesting. And the trailer that he lived in was just that. It was a very small decrepit trailer. The, the trailer, in fact, when, when it was finally removed from the car lot, it was given away. First person to come in and hook up and pull this thing out of here owns this thing. It was one of those, but that's where he was living. He was really sacrificing. And he started to win some fights and he went all the way to a world championship, not just a championship fight. He won the damn thing. He's got the belt. And Evan was a very quiet guy. And as much as I tell you, he was my friend and my teammate. I knew Evan and I cared for Evan. But having a conversation with Evan was tough. He just didn't say much. He was a quiet guy. And somewhere along the way, he got himself an, a computer with a connection to the internet. And there was a space out, a site out there called MySpace. MySpace was here before Facebook was a word. And he would go on MySpace while boozing on benders where he'd stay up for a couple of days straight. And he would put this plan together that he was advertising to the kids on MySpace who were all telling him what a genius he was. And he explained his plan to me at one point where he was going to get a house. He was going to put nothing but walls and cubicles in the house, fill it up with guys. They were all going to dress the same. He had a vision. He had a vision that every morning at 8 a.m., the garage door opens and in single file, these 16 athletes come running out. And they run to a gym, and he was talking to the owner of the gym. He was taking steps to make this happen, that, they, that the gym owner would give them all memberships. And they would help to promote the gym in some fashion when they, when they make it and they're fighting on TV. Okay, but he had this whole thing lined out. He was talking to restaurants in town where they could all come in as a group, all dressed in their gray sweat tops. And sweat. He explained the whole thing to me. They would eat, sleep, train, do everything. Again, I'm going, Evan, man, to me, that sounds like a cult. This is, I don't like this idea. This is weird. There's gyms all over the place. Why do all the guys got to live together? Guys are living wherever they're living now, and then you drive to the gym. I just, I don't understand the concept. It seems a little bizarre. But he would stay up, and it'd be at like 2 and 3 and 4 in the morning, and he'd be laying out this plan, and he'd have people trying to sign up and, and, and send in their application, why they need this and how this could change their life and all these great things. So now he was feeling 
compelled and noble about it. And this was the pursuit that he was going on. And Evan owed everybody money. And Evan was always good for it. He would all, he'd go have a fight. He would be broke, but he would pay everybody back. And there was some times where Evan owed money and he was even buying bikes off of eBay, setting them up in his garage, fixing them, like painting a bike and fix the chain and, you know, buy it, buy it for 80 bucks and fix it up a little and sell it for 200 bucks. I mean, he was working hard, but there's pay people back. He was just an honest guy. I mean, that is a, a very good thing, right? You loan a guy money, he pays you. He's an honest guy. But he was also always behind. He liked to gamble a little bit and he was into the drinking. And I remember when he would send these things out on MySpace because they would be time stamped. You could see when he sent them out. You could follow the timeline and go, Evan, there hasn't been a two hour window here in the last three days where you've not posted something. Have you not slept in three days? And he finally gets this wild idea that he is, and this is a quote, going to get on his motorcycle and drive so far into the desert that one mistake could cost him his life. That's a quote. And the kids online, the same kids that were telling the ramblings of a drunk man, what a genius he was, were now encouraging that he go ride his motorcycle in the desert so far that one mistake would cost him his life. And it did. It did. If you have any story that starts that way, I'm going to go do something and I'm going to do it to the extreme that it could cost me my life. How about not doing that thing? Why would anybody encourage you to do that? And what kind of odyssey are you on? What kind of walkabout is it that you need to drive a motorcycle into the desert? The whole thing's weird. What if I what if I did that, guys? What if I disappeared for a few days and I come back and I tell you guys what I did? What if I never did it? Who would know? Why do I actually have to go into the desert to tell you what it was like to sleep in the desert amongst a rattlesnake? And be in the, the hot sun all day. Why would I need to do that? W what was it to be gained by driving into the What the hell's in the desert? It's just hot. Go get in a sauna. What is it you were looking at? You weren't looking to visit with anybody. Nobody was out there. And why would you have to go so far into it? What changes in the desert? What changed in the first five steps of that desert between the sun and the sand and the cactuses that was different 500 miles into it by the time he runs out of gas and can't get back. What was different? It was amongst the dumb ideas ever. Which is why when I hear these Evan stories come out and nobody calls it for what it was, I feel as though you're disrespecting my friend and teammate. If there's anything that we need to gain by the Evan Tanner story, sometimes it's what not to do. And when I hear this story get sensationalized by total strangers as a way of showing a respect to Evan, there's something nice about that. There's something kind about that. But to disrespect Evan by trying to glamorize one of the more foolish things that you could ever do in the first place, the most foolish thing that he ever did, he never came back. And trying to tell the story that way, that this was some kind of a young man on a journey to change his life, that's not what happened. My buddy got drunk and did something stupid, and it cost him his life. That is what happened. 